Still have no idea why my beer is disappearing so fast. There's no explanation for it. So I'm happy now I got that security system installed. Maybe I'll actually get an idea of what's going on. But anyway, that's enough reading for tonight. I think it's bedtime. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today's video is a very special one and a little bit of a bittersweet one for myself. This is the final video that I will be filming in my New Hampshire apartment. I'm about to move back down to Massachusetts to the Boston area. This has been a relatively long time coming, but I'm very excited to see what the future holds. And uh, I have no intention of slowing things down or stopping things for the channel once I get to this new place. Once I start putting out some new content in the new place, I think you're gonna like how things look down there. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that sort of thing. There's already a little bit of content on the channel from it. Today's brew is heavily inspired by Ipswich Ale. Ipswich Ale is a really nice English pale ale that's made by Ipswich Brewery uh, in Ipswich, Massachusetts. <laughs> it doesn't get simpler than that. It's a really nice, easy drinking beer that is very nice and rich, biscuity, malty uh, in character, but still quite light in color. And uh, it's something I've been wanting to try for a long time. I do need to do more English beers. It's been a very long time since I've done a proper English pale ale. So um, I am intending on doing more of those uh, as this year goes on. I'm also gonna be brewing with a very special ingredient that I have never worked with ever before, but have been meaning to for a long time, a heritage malt, uh, specifically Crisp Chevalier. Heritage malts basically are made to be very similar to the way that uh, malts were made back in the golden ages of brewing in the late 1800s. At its core, it's a uniquely flavored uh, and a little bit less modified version of an English pale malt. I'm not really quite sure exactly what results I'm gonna get from it, other than just probably a lower efficiency or a lower extract yield, uh, but from what I can tell, it's going to be a very flavorful malt choice. It makes up nearly 100% of the beer I'm making today, so um, it's gonna be a really good indicator of how this thing tastes. If I had to categorize the beer I'm trying to make today, I would say it's probably an ESB, uh, but it's a very pale version of one. So uh, typically an ESB is gonna be kind of more amber copper colored. This one's going to be pretty pale, probably in the light gold color. But we are adding a little tiny bit of English medium crystal to it to give it a little bit of that classic character. I'm going to be using East Kent Goldings in the recipe because they are my favorite English hop by far. Um, and it's just got this amazing earthy floral character to it. And I'm hoping that that comes through in a nice kind of almost single malt beer like this one. It should be a pretty straightforward and simple brew day. Um, although I am extending my mash rest in this case just to make sure that we can fully convert the less modified malt. Just giving it a little more time is going to help with that. Big thank you to the following uh, organizations for help make this video possible. First of all, Northern Brewer for providing the ingredients for this batch of beer, uh, including that Chevalier Heritage Malt. So if you like what happens out of this video, you can find it on Northern Brewer's website. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, that's the system I have been using for the last year and a half now. Uh, fantastic system, fantastic people. Check out their YouTube channel for more. And lastly, a big thank you to Grillaholics as well. They offer higher quality equipment than you might find on Amazon. If you are as into grilling and smoking meats as I am, which is not something I have a channel on, but it's something I still definitely enjoy, please check out Grillaholics for some high quality grilling and smoking 
products. I drop links to all three down in the description box, so please check them out when you got some time. And also, one of my subscribers, Mark, sent me a really nice brewing journal and asked me what I thought about it. So here it is, I'm integrating it into this video. He has a really well thought out, really well laid out, and very just kind of down to the numbers brewing journal uh, that I've really found myself enjoying. I'm used to a different one than I've used for a while. I've been using it for a couple brews now and I've been really impressed with the way it's laid out. There's a lot of information you can put on two pages with this journal, which I really like. Uh, Mark and I have been collaborating for a couple weeks, working on ironing out some of the kinks and I've added a couple suggestions in here. So if you really wanna make Mark's day, go ahead and pick up one of those journals. I've linked it down in the description box. It's on Amazon, plenty of different options for cover uh, and they're really very affordable and I think it's really well worth it so uh, big thank you to him for sending those my way all right so now for the recipe we are going to be using as I said crisp Chevalier heritage malt for the base malt we're using 10 pounds of that and then on top of that I'll be adding half a pound of torrefied wheat um, which is going to aid in head retention and just kind of fluffiness in the body. And last but certainly not least is just a quarter pound, just a touch of faucet medium crystal. Your basic generic 20, 40, 60, 80 lava bond crystal malts are not something I typically use when I'm brewing. I just don't like the way that that flavor comes across and how sweet it makes things. Uh, I will use them rarely, but in English brewing, crystal malt is indeed traditional. And in that case, it's often always better to go with an actual English crystal malt as opposed to a generic American one. And if you have to pick an English crystal malt, I would recommend picking faucet malts. They make some of the best English malts available. It's just well worth it. So for hops, I'm gonna be using uh, East Kent Goldings only. So all of my East Kent Goldings is 5.6% alpha acid. So I'll be adding an ounce and a half uh, at 60 minutes for bittering, and then just the other half ounce that remains from the packages uh, at zero minutes, just for a little bit of aroma. Hopefully that all comes through. For my water profile, um, I'm going for a relatively balanced profile with some medium amount of mineral content. So what I'm going for is 68 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 27 parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 81 parts per million of sulfate and 70 parts per million of bicarbonate. So in order to get that water profile, I'm starting with a base of distilled water. So you can copy this if you want to. I'm adding to eight gallons of distilled water, uh, three grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, five grams of calcium chloride and three grams of baking soda to get that water profile. So for the mash, we're gonna be using a traditional English method of mashing, which is the classic single temperature, single infusion mash. I'll be holding the mash at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes, adding that extra time in there just to ensure that we get a good conversion um, for the entire thing. And a mash temperature of 150 should get us a really nice, highly drinkable beer, uh, which is definitely a characteristic of the Ipswich Ale and a characteristic of the English bitter style. So for the yeast, I'll be using Y yeast 1098 British Ale. Uh, I have made a starter of that just to be sure that we're good to go for fermentation. Today I'll be brewing with my good friend Chris, so if you see a second person in the shots, that's, uh, that's gonna be him. So please enjoy the final shots of this apartment during this brew day. Cheers. I added eight gallons of distilled water to my claw hammer supply 120 volt system and it started to heat it up to the mash temperature. While it was heating, I measured out all of my water salts and added those to the strike water as well as milled my grain. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash and got everything well circulated. Next, I started recirculating the wort uh, from the bottom through the lid and back into the mash. I let the mash sit at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 minutes, but 10 minutes in, I took a pH reading and I saw an on-target pH of 5.27. After the pH reading, I let the mash sit for 80 more minutes and then I raised the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit and let it sit there for 15 minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for 15 more minutes. I also fired up the controller to 100% power at this time. Using my uh, newly acquired Anton Parr Easy Dents, I saw a pre-boil gravity of 1042, which was four points lower than target. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition, which was an ounce and a half of East Kent Goldings. Once 
Once 50 minutes had elapsed, I added some yeast nutrient and a Wolflock tablet. And then 10 minutes later, I added my zero minute hop addition, which was half an ounce of East Kent Goldings. I killed the boil at that point by starting to recirculate boiling wort through the chiller and the pump, which is just in my opinion the easiest way to ensure sanitation of all your chilling equipment. After being sure everything was all sterilized, I began to chill down to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. I took an OG sample using my Easy Dense once more, and I saw an OG of 1046, which was six points lower than the target OG. But that's fine, because this beer is supposed to be low gravity in general. I aerated by splashing into my anvil bucket fermenter once everything was all cooled down, and then I pitched my yeast and I left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, first of all, we'll talk about alternative yeast to use for the style. If you're going to use dry yeast, I would recommend uh, going with Safale SO4, uh, which is going to be your typical British strain, or Lalaman Nottingham Ale yeast. Uh, both of those are going to get you where you need to go. Um, otherwise, there's a variety of different British yeasts to choose from. I would recommend using an English yeast for this style because it does give you that kind of little extra kind of fruitiness, a little extra roundness uh, to the ale that you would not otherwise get with an American yeast or with a Kvike yeast. British yeast absolutely needs temperature control though. It is a very finicky yeast. It has a really nasty reputation for producing a lot of diacetyl if you ferment it too hot. It also has a reputation for producing overripe fruit and kind of like rotten fruit character if you get too hot as well. So just be very mindful to keep that on the low side of things. So my plan for this fermentation is to uh, keep it around 62 to 65 degrees. It's also not going to attenuate as far as American yeasts will. So keep that in mind as well. Um, just because it does have such a big reputation for producing diacetyl I am going to ensure I do a little bit of a diacetyl rest at the end so basically that means I'm going to complete fermentation at 62 to 65 degrees and then once that's done I'll take it out of my fermentation chamber and let it rise up to about 72 degrees for three to five days and blow off all of that diacetyl let the yeast continue their fermentation finish things up clean up their byproducts and off flavors uh, so that we have a nice clean British beer instead of a buttery one now this can very well also be made out as an American ale, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just keep in mind, you might want to raise the initial mash temperature if you do that, because it will attenuate a bit further down. For my case, I'm looking at a final gravity of about 1012, and uh, if I was using maybe like US05 or BRY97 yeasts, I would probably, which are American yeasts, I would probably expect it to be more like 1010 final gravity. So there's gonna be a little bit more attenuation there, just be prepared for that. Same thing with Kvike. Now Kvike is a good one to use if you want a neutral kind of character to this beer. If you use the Kvike, it's gonna be very much more like the American type of uh, character. In that case, you don't need to worry too much about temperature control and you definitely don't need to worry about diacetyl. If you're trying to go for an English version of this, I would say don't pressure ferment it. It's probably not worth it. Uh, it's just not going to get you the right kind of esters. If you pressure ferment it, it's just not really gonna be all that great. It's gonna be kind of bland. You want a little bit of yeast expression in here, just a little bit, uh, but not too much because it's an ale and it's specifically a British ale which has a little bit of that high fruity character. Um, you don't want too much obviously, but you want a little bit and I would definitely for that reason recommend not pressure fermenting this one. Otherwise though, it's a relatively simple beer to ferment. If you have the ability to keep a straight 62 to 65 degrees, you're gonna be golden. Uh, so I would just go with that. So that's my plan and I'll be fermenting this one in about 62 to 65 degrees for about 10 to 14 days. Yeah, um, and then I'll be raising it up to 72 degrees or room temperature for me for about three to five days for a diacetyl rest before I package. And uh, that's it. So I'll see you guys in a few weeks and you'll be looking at a very different background. Over the course of about 15 days, the beer fermented down only to about 1014 final gravity, giving us an apparent attenuation of about 68% for an ABV of 4.1%. The beer is called, well, I didn't actually name it because I don't like it. The beer is coming in at 4.1% ABV and 29 IBUs.
So for the appearance of the beer, it's pouring a murky, hazy, kind of orange color. Um, it has a white head that has good head retention, leaves a good surface layer. So as you can see, different background. Yes, this is uh, basically gonna be my tasting room from now on. I'm at the new place. This is the back porch and um, things are a little different. So bear with me as I kind of figure out how I'm gonna do my lighting, how I'm gonna do my shots and stuff like that. But for now, this is what it's gonna look like. As you can see, this beer came out really way different than anticipated and there's a lot of reasons for that. So I'm gonna go through this. I'm gonna talk through every single one of those factors and explain to you why they happened, why this is the way it is and what you can do if you're making this beer in order to prevent them from happening to yourself. So now I'm going for aroma. On the aroma of the beer, I get kind of like a medium graininess. And there's a slight fruitiness to it. Kind of like a, an, kind of like a banana, mostly banana. Maybe a little bit of a peach as well. It's kind of got that, it's got that kind of overripe fruit character though, and uh, there's more on that later. Now let's go in for mouthfeel. Mouthfeel is not terrible. Um, it's kind of medium full bodied. It's got a lot more mouthfeel than I expected. It's not as drinkable as I expected, and it has a rather high carbonation level. But otherwise, it's very full bodied, almost thick, uh, and that's not really appropriate for the style, uh, or it keeps it from being very drinkable, which is a problem. And now, let's go in for flavor. <sighs> yeah, not quite right. I'll talk about what's wrong with the flavor most specifically and why. It has a decent grain base to it. it has a decent amount of malty sweetness, biscuitiness, um, and just kind of a little bit of a toasty character as well. But that's about where the good stuff ends. Um, this is chock full of DMS. I'm not getting DMS in the form of corn though. I'm getting it in the form of vegetal flavor. Um, kind of like old cabbage. It's not pleasant um, and it's in here and uh, I'm not quite happy about that. There's also kind of like a weird sweetness in the background that when combined with the DMS makes this taste really, really awful. Combine that with the overripe fruitiness of the yeast um, and it's just not a good beer. So that concludes the tasting portion of this video, but now we're gonna talk about why these things are the way they are and what went wrong. When this beer came out of the fermenter, it was crystal clear and it tasted quite good, although there was some detectable DMS. It tasted pretty close to the Ipswich Ale target that I was going for. However, as soon as I kegged the beer, I took that keg, put it in my car, and I moved it down here along with the rest of my brewing gear. And in the process, that beer that had cold crashed and clarified, all of a sudden had all of its sediment shaken up again in the keg. And ever since then, that was two weeks ago, ever since then, it has failed to clarify. I initially find it with a two-stage finding agent super clear. And then I also threw gelatin at it later. Uh, and then after that, I threw half a bottle of Biofine at it. And all the whole time, this beer has been sitting at 32 degrees in an attempt to lager it and get the stuff to drop out. And it's simply not budging. So, I've kind of given up on it at this point. Clarity isn't really the whole story here. It kind of still tastes like crap. It's gonna get dumped. But the thing is, there's a significant haze in here that wasn't in here before, and it's way too thick and opaque to be chill haze. It's a starch or a protein haze, I think, that got kicked up into the beer and really resulted in this just very cloudy English pale ale. And this is also going hand in hand with the reason why I didn't hit my numbers and got a very low ABV compared to what I anticipated. And that's because I failed to actually convert all the starches during the mash. I didn't do a starch test. I should have done that. I usually don't do that because my mash is converted 90% of the time, but I failed to treat the crisp Chevalier heritage malt as exactly that, a heritage malt. And that's the reason why we also have DMS. Heritage malts are made in the old ways and they are not as modified as their modern counterparts. And as a result, they actually require a lot more effort in order to unlock the starches and sugars properly for a, a good mash. So even though I thought a good long 90 minute mash rest would be sufficient, I guess it wasn't. I could have gone back and step mash this whole thing in order to get good proper conversion. And I think I would have had a much better result if I had done that. 
an incomplete conversion left a ton of starches in the beer, which contributed to this haze, I think. Add to that that I also brewed with wheat in this mix, and that also contributed to the starches and the protein content. But it doesn't end there. The next step of the brewing process is the boil, and at the boil, I failed to boil this long enough. I should have known that as a heritage malt, this would probably be a little bit more likely to produce DMS. Modern malts don't have as much of the precursor to DMS in them, and hence you can get away with things like a 30 minute boil most of the time. But this is a heritage malt made in the old ways and therefore might be a lot more susceptible to producing DMS. Either way, there is DMS in this beer in quantity, and I should have done probably a 90 minute boil or even longer in order to get rid of all of that DMS. Lastly, in the fermentation, things went wrong here too. Obviously, there's a overripe fruit character or a rotten fruit character that's coming out of this British ale yeast, which is indicative that I either didn't treat it right or fermented too hot. Now, when I pitched my yeast, I pitched a good starter's worth. I do believe that I pitched a sufficient amount of yeast for this particular beer, and especially for its original gravity. I also added yeast nutrients, so I don't think it was devoid of nutrients, and it was definitely oxygenated well. So I think the only thing left is actually fermentation temperature. I fermented at 65, perhaps the temperature probe was not calibrated properly, or perhaps more than likely, 65 is just too hot for this particular yeast in this type of beer, and it just ended up manifesting itself as a rotten fruit character. Either way, this beer is pretty much a total failure, um, but I wanna make sure that you guys can learn from this if you choose to make either the recipe yourselves or if you choose to go ahead and do something similar um, with your own heritage malts. Make sure you're treating them as under-modified malts, as historical malts, something that you're gonna need to do a little bit of uh, extra process with. So while this is kind of an unfortunate circumstance for my first grain of glass video coming back here at the new place, I'm gonna make it up to you guys because we've got a much better beer on the way and it's going to be ready in time for a video for next week. So I'm going to break tradition and do two back-to-back -back grain of glass videos to basically make up for this shortcoming here. Uh, I think you're really going to like the next one, so stay tuned for that. Either way, let me know in the comments, do you think I should rebrew this beer, making those corrections that I talked about? Would that be beneficial to see the same thing twice? Or would you like to see me just kind of move on and go to the next thing or just tackle an English pale ale in a different way some other time? I'm up for both, so let me know down in the comments what you think is best. So after this video is all finished, I'm probably gonna go ahead and dump this beer. Not everything is a success story here. I am not a perfect brewer and I will make mistakes just like the rest of us. So I wanna make sure that that is shown as well on YouTube that you guys can see and learn from, hopefully, that's the most important thing, learn from my mistakes so that you don't make them yourselves. So even though it was a crappy beer, I hope you learned something. Please hit the like button, hit the comment, subscribe buttons as well regardless of that. And make sure you check out Mark's Brew Journal. It will help make you better beer. If you want to support the channel, please go ahead and pick up one of these t-shirts like this one is a good example. Um, I have plenty more that are down below the description box at my Teespring store. I also have a Patreon linked down in the description box. That's a great way to help support me. Uh, my Patreon supporters are really driving the production behind this channel and helping make it a better YouTube channel in the long run. I also have channel memberships now. So if you want to check that out for like two bucks a month, you get a couple perks. If you're interested in purchasing some home brewing equipment that I personally recommend and have used and is available on Amazon, I have an Amazon store in the description box. So don't forget to check that out if you're curious. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I am also active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. So please check that out as well. Last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. It does mean a lot to me. And I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers. Oh. Not chugging that, sorry. <laughs>